Well, good morning, guys. Welcome again to the First Baptist Church of Carthage. It's great to have everybody here this morning. Welcome those joining us online. If you want to grab your Bibles, open up your Bibles to Luke, Luke 14. Um, there's a parable that begins um, around Luke 15. Luke 14, um, 12 kind of sets up the parable that we really want to read today. Um, years ago, I did a whole series on the parables of Jesus. We, we studied them one parable after another in the order that Jesus taught them. 46 of them. We're going to do that again at some point in time. It was right after I first got here. There was one parable out of all those parables that I did not do. And that's the one we're going to do here this morning. And uh, Jesus put this, God put this parable on my heart a couple of weeks ago. And it really helped me um, as we approach the music fest time. And so um, he, he put it on my heart to share this parable. And I really wanted to do it last week, but God already put something else in my heart. So we did last week's message for graduation Sunday, The Road Goes, The Road Goes. Um, but for today, um, this parable was comforting me. And I think it'll be comforting you um, as well as we approach this. It might be convicting, it might be comforting, it might be a little of both. God's word is amazing, God's word is good. So we are only one week away from the North Country Music Festival, one week. Um, next Friday night, we're going to talk more about it at the end. Um, next Friday is actually when we set the stage up and things like that. Um, the North Country Music Festival, okay, music festivals, um, I've been doing ministry 35 plus years and I've just seen how music speaks to people in different ways. Okay, we use music to teach children the alphabet. And we use music for all different reasons. I have seen, after all these years of teen ministry, um, how music impacts people. We can all remember the lyrics of songs so much easier than we can remember a fact or memorize words. Um, I gotta say, I like Meredith's version of that last song better than that one. She does it on the piano and blow you away. She'll do it sometime, but... Um, yeah, the, the, the lyrics, and it, they just touch you when you read these lyrics. You can learn a lot from these lyrics. And these bands that are coming here, they're, they're modern-day musicianaries, and they're here to share the gospel um, with people, and that's why they do what they do. Um, I have invited personally about 100 or more churches, different churches. We're getting close to 150 churches that I've contacted about the music festival. Uh, just to give them an opportunity. It's an opportunity where different churches can bring in their people. I hear people say it's not my style of music, or we don't have a youth group, or we don't have a men's group. You might not. Okay, if you have one or two kids, bring them to the music festival. Have them bring a couple of friends with them. Now you got something going. Okay, we're the body of Christ. We're here to be um, unified and try to work together and not try to do a hundred different things in a hundred different directions. We're here to um, be here for each other, um, help churches, pray for churches, things like that. We're here to the whole goal of the North Country Music Festival is to point people to Jesus Christ. And we attempt to do that through music and word and prayer and love and action. Okay, when people go there, I want them to experience some of Jesus. I want them to feel that, to understand that. So we've invited um, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. I thank you guys so much. We've handed out over 2,500 flyers at the parades and at the farmer's market. You guys took your own initiative to go to all the pharmacies and gas stations and hang them up on bulletin boards and things like that. So that's all awesome. Um, we want to get the word out about Jesus. And we want to do it the best way we can. Um, if you ever listen to Froggy 97, check it out this Wednesday. This Wednesday morning, James Pond um, has invited me to go there and um, co-host with him for four hours or so. So I'll be there in the morning and Wednesday morning. So check that out. We get to talk about the music fest for four hours. I don't know how much I can say or what I can say and things like that, but um, we're going to be there and we're going to be talking about the music fest. So that's awesome. So why do we do all this? Like the whole idea is not to draw a huge crowd. Okay. Obviously the more people there, the better. We're not making a dime on this. We're spending a lot of money to put this festival on. Um, the Kingdom Bound Christian Music Festival is a huge music festival at Darien Lake. If you're not familiar with it, it's a Six Flags Park. They get, they used to get 60, 70,000 people there. They expect about 40 or 50,000 this year, I believe. So that's a lot of people going to this Christian music festival. We used to take kids there from our youth group, um, 65, 75 kids from youth group. We'd take them to this festival. The number one comment I heard back from teenagers was that if every kid went to Kingdom Bound one time, we'd have a different school, we'd have a different community. So. Um, we couldn't take any more than we were 
physically. So we tried to take a taste of kingdom on back here. And that's what the music fest is about. Okay, we've done it for um, a number of years in Hannibal. This is our seventh music fest that we've organized here. The sixth one, the COVID year, we couldn't do six. Six year we've carried it out here, plus so many concerts and coffee houses and ways that we've used music to point people to Jesus. Okay, that's what it's all about. We're not trying to draw huge numbers. We're trying to point people to Jesus. That's what it's about. It'd be really easy to draw huge numbers. Okay, if I wanted to draw huge numbers, we'd have a wine tent, we'd have a, a beer booth, and I'd have gambling tables, and we pack the place. That's not our goal. Okay, our goal is, is not to do that. I think Jesus would want to flip some tables. Um, in that situation. And again, it's um, our goal is to point people to Jesus. And um, we're not judging the success of an event by numbers. Um, financially, we're not asking any money, so there's no way to judge it there. And I've had people tell me this is a waste of time, it's a waste of money, it's a waste of resources, and you, you don't understand the music festival then. Um, this church, I thank you guys so much. You have caught the vision, you understand it, and we're behind it. Um, other churches are beginning to see the vision and catch on now as well. It's just about pointing people to Jesus, about doing ministry. So um, it's, it's pretty exciting what's going on. God looks at our obedience, not the outcome. So when God lays something on your heart to do something, do it. Okay? He's going to give you more than what you need to get it done. And uh, sometimes, like the little sign out front, you might look at that sign. There's a new white sign about the music fest. Um, it was free. I, I just used stuff I found here yesterday in the garage, in the basement, um, some old sign letters I found. I put it together. It wasn't enough letters to spell market, so it's market. But you, you get the idea. <laughs> and, um, but it's free. You know, God says, I give you all this stuff. Do what you can with it to further my kingdom. And when you're obedient with what he gives you, he'll bless you back with more. I truly believe that because the Bible says that. So, um, somebody asked me a couple weeks ago, they're like, oh, the music fest is getting really close. Are you getting nervous? Are you, are you nervous no one's going to come? Or you? I said, no, I'm not really nervous at all. At this point in time, it's like a big ball rolling down a hill. I just got to stay out of the way. Okay, I am already, we are already planning for the next music fest, second Saturday next year. Okay, second Saturday next year. Um, we're already planning for the next one. We had three separate festivals planned this year, and this is the one that got open the doors for. This is the one that um, formed, so this is the one we're having. And, whether people come or not, that's not my concern. I've done, I believe we've done as much as we can do um, this year. And so this parable that we're going to read here in just a minute, God put on my heart a couple weeks ago after I had that question. And because uh, I, it got me wondering, like, okay, I'm not nervous, but am I a little nervous? And then God put, God put this on my heart. And he's like, no. Oh. And uh, so we're going to read this parable here in a minute. So let's pray. And then you'll hear the parable that I heard that brought me some peace because this parable, take, it took the worry off of me. And I believe this parable will take the worry off of you as well. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for each and every person that's here this morning. We all came here for a reason. It could be anywhere, but you drew us here. Father, I pray that we just sit back and just listen to you and for you. Father, I pray that we're open to what we're about to hear. Father, I pray that anytime we read your word, we know it's powerful. We know that it's going to change our lives. We know that it's going to cause us to look at what we're doing in our lives. Father, I pray we're open to that. That's how we grow. Um, Father, I pray that we're not just open to we listen and we apply what we're about to hear to our lives. We allow it to make changes where need, where need be. And then we go out and we, we share these truths with those in our corner of the world. Father, finally, allow me to speak accurately and clearly the truth that you've laid on my heart to share with this family this morning. Jesus name. Amen. So open your Bibles to Luke 14. 14, 12 is where we're going to start. Just to set the stage a little bit. And I did do a message on this setup part. So Jesus was invited to this big dinner. Okay, Jesus is sitting at this big dinner. Mostly Jewish people were there. Pharisees and Sadducees. And they're trying to trap Jesus. Okay, they're trying to trap him into working on the Sabbath. Okay, and he did heal. He, he healed someone's hand. And then this story takes place. And I needed to back up from the parable that I really wanted to share because this little parable within a parable, this little uh, few verses sets up our parable this morning. It's really important to read this part first. So Jesus is sitting at this big dinner, and these people are sitting all around him, mostly Jewish people, and they're, and they're having dinner. And this discussion takes place, verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a, a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. 
If you do, they might invite you back, and so you will be repaid. Verse 13. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they, although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Let's pause there. So without going really too deep into that parable than a parable, there's a lesson there that we really got to pull out because this one little lesson kind of sets up um, a lot of what we're going to be going through this week and especially next weekend. Okay, Jesus is basically saying that if you do something for other, um, for other people, do it with a servant's heart. Don't do it thinking that you're going to be repaid for what you're doing. You just do it because you want to do it. You don't expect money for it. You don't expect a pat on the back for it. You're just doing it. Okay, that's the first lesson that we're learning today. It's an important lesson because um, some of us are going to be pretty bit busy this week. And some of us are going to be doing a lot of work, especially Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And it's not work for us. It's work for the Lord. It's work for other people. We want people to know about Jesus. Um, there's a dying world outside these doors. We want them to know about Jesus. So don't do something for people because they can do something for you in return or you expect something in return. Do things for other people out of love for them. Out of love for God and out of love for these other people. Tell people about Jesus because you care for them, not for the path back. Okay, Jesus is saying this little sermon within a um, parable within a parable. Jesus says, serve God, serve others, not expecting to receive anything back. And if you do, then you have a servant's heart. And that's what we want to get to. We want to get to that point where we have that servant's heart. We just do things because we love people. And then Jesus adds this, and it almost sounds a little churchy. He says, um, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, that's kind of your pat. You'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Okay, hang on to those, that little phrase because that becomes very important what's going to happen next. Um, when Jesus mentioned the resurrection of the righteous, one of these religious people, a Pharisee or a Sadducee, we don't really know, one of these religious people sitting at the table said this, coming back, this statement. He said, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Let me read that again. So, so Jesus says um, that you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. And then this guy just chimes right in. He says, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Okay, it almost sounds like um, he's saying, blessed are the righteous. It's almost like he's trying to impress Jesus with this, this comment. Yeah, it's almost like, yeah, right on, you and me, Jesus. Like, I'm righteous. Blessed am I. It's kind of the feel you get when you read this. And, and that sentence is going to set up this whole parable. Okay, Jesus heard that comment, and then he's going to reply with this parable. He wanted to teach this guy something. And he wants to teach us something. Jesus shares the lesson. Um, it's called the parable of the great banquet. Let's pick it up in verse 16. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. Verse 18. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Verse 19. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Verse 21, the servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became very angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the alleys of the towns and, and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. Then some time passes. And then you read verse 22. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Let's pause there for a minute. So in this parable, you have a man at first. He's called a man and he's Plan this huge banquet. And he already sent out one set of invitations. We know that because the scripture said that. But the Jewish people would understand that completely about the invitations. There were only two invitations. 
Okay, the first invitation was sent out just to let people know the bank was coming up. It was kind of like save the date or the RSVP, whatever that thing is that I never do. But, but it's sent out at first. You know, there's a banquet coming up. I want you to be there. You're invited the first time. The second invitation um, is this invitation where the servant would come and say, we're ready. It's time. The time has come. The banquet's ready. The food's prepared. It's time to eat. Come to the table. So when this banquet was ready, the man, the master, sent out his servant to contact each one of the previously invited guests, telling them that everything was ready, the feast is about to start. But one after another, the guests made up these excuses for not coming. One just bought the piece of land, he didn't go see it. One just purchased some oxen, got to go try them out. The other one just got married, he can't come. When the master heard these wimpy excuses, he got angry, scripture says. So he told the servant, go back out in the streets, go back out there, the alleyways, go canvas the town, find the, whoever you can, the, the poor, the, the crippled, the blind, the lame. I have this amazing banquet prepared for these people. I want them to come in and enjoy this banquet. I have something for these people. Tell them to come in. The servant had already brought in those people, the down and out townspeople, and there was still more room in the banquet hall. What does scripture say? So the master sent his servant out on this broader search. And you can't help but think here about the Great Commission. And Jesus said both of these, but here in this parable, um, the master says, go out to the roads in the country lanes, compel everyone to come in, compel them. Why? So the house will be full. Go out to every corner of the land and invite people in. I have prepared this amazing place for them. Go, compel them to come in. And then Jesus ends the parable by relating the master's assurance that not one of those people who were invited and made up an excuse not to come will even get a taste of my banquet. Let's take a step back for a minute. So Jesus is telling a parable. He told a lot of parables, short stories with meanings, um, messages, things that we can relate to, things that the Jewish people could relate to in the day, things that still apply to us today. The kingdom is here. Jesus is saying the table is ready. Invitations have been, have, have been sent. That's what he's telling these people. And then let's go back to that statement that I said prompted this whole parable. If it wasn't for this statement, he might not have told this parable. Okay, this statement is key. The man that said that he looks forward to dining in the kingdom of God. Remember the guy sitting there, the righteous man that kind of chimed right in. He thought for sure he'd be eating in the kingdom of God. Why? He's one of these Jewish leaders. He's followed the rules. In that day and age, the, the, the thinking of the day would be that if you're a Jewish person, of course you're going to eat in the kingdom of God then you're in because you've kept all these laws and rules and rituals. And that's what these Jewish people still thought. He was blessed by all he'd done. That's what he thought. He and the other religious people at the dinner represent the original invited guests in the parable. All of those who, who claim and think they know God, but in reality they're missing him. These other people sitting with Jesus at this dinner, they had the rules, but they didn't have the relation. And Jesus was right there in front of them, but they didn't believe who he was. They couldn't see. They believed the kingdom was just prepared for them because they were religious, because they thought they were righteous, because they said the right words. The parable that Jesus tells us here is aimed at debunking that notion. Jesus wants to change people's way of thinking. His parable caused them to think again, rethink what they're believing. In the parable, the master of the house is God, and the great banquet is the kingdom. In real life, Jesus came preaching that the kingdom of heaven is near, and all who believe in him would go there. So scripture says Jesus says that. Jesus is the servant in the parable. Jesus gave the invitation, but we know by reading scripture that he was rejected. 
People give excuses for not accepting the invitation. We can read in John 1, 11, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Why didn't they receive him? Some pretty selfish reasons. In the parable, the excuses for not skipping the banquet, they're pretty lame. If you think about it, one guy says, I just bought a piece of land, so I can't come to this banquet. Who buys land without seeing the property first? Okay, if you do buy land without seeing the property first, I have some beautiful land in, in Florida and everybody's that I can definitely sell you, but nobody does that. No one's gonna buy land without seeing it. And if you did, say you do buy a piece of land, you have to go and walk it right now, this day, this hour. The banquet's only what an hour or two long, you gotta do it right now. Or if you're in the bank, you gotta go walk the land. How about the next one? I just bought some oxen. I can't come to this banquet. I know you prepared it. I know you want me to go and enjoy it. You got something for me, but I got these new ox and I got to go try them out. Okay, who buys like farm equipment without trying them out first? And you can't try them out this afternoon. Can't try them out tomorrow. The next all week long. And that was the wedding people. They just got married. So you can't come. Yeah, I would think if you got married, you, if you were like us, you'd probably go for the free food, get a free meal, a nice banquet. Um, you're just starting off. Things are a little tight. You want to go show the world your better half, that sort of thing. You gotta go right now. You can't come to the banquet because you just got married. It seems like a lame excuse. All three of these excuses, and these are just the three that they gave. I'm sure the Bible, um, I'm sure the, the writer here, I'm sure Jesus could have gave many more lame examples. I'm sure we can come up with some lame examples on our own. Um, but all three of these excuses in the parable, they just reveal the insincerity of those who were invited. Okay kind of shows their true colors, if you will. It shows they don't really have devotion to the master. Um, their priorities are way out of whack. It shows that they don't really have this loving relationship with that master. They don't really care. If they wanted to be there, they'd be there. So you can't just say, I, I know what you're offering me is amazing, and, and, and you want me to go there and prepare this stuff for me. And it was really nice of you to offer it to me, but no thanks, I would rather do this. So we come up with a reason or an excuse because we think it sounds better than the truth. We think that excuse is easier to swallow than saying, I, I don't feel like coming because I got something better to do than to be with you. The common interpretation here is that the Jews in Jesus' day, they had no valid excuse for ignoring Jesus. That's what Jesus is trying to get across here. You have no valid excuse for not getting it, not seeing who I really am. Okay, not understanding my messages, not understanding my teachings. Actually, these guys had every reason to believe that he was the Messiah. They saw the miracles. I mean, they saw this guy heal people, have them walk. They, if anyone's going to believe, it should have been those people that actually saw the miracles, followed him around, listening to the teachings. Worst case scenario, people sitting there heard the first, first case, like, I would see a miracle, and I would tell you, you would see firsthand, you would hear firsthand testimony about this Jesus. They had every reason to believe, but they came up with excuses not to. In the detail that the invitation was then extended to everyone in society, that's the next really important point here. Okay, the ones who were already invited made up excuses, we're not coming. The next people were invited, the downtrodden, the poor. It's so important. These are the types of people that the Pharisees considered unclean. Okay, The Pharisees believed that if you had some kind of a problem, if you weren't one of us, that God was down on you in some way. Maybe he's punishing you or your parents or your grandparents in some way. You're unclean. We don't want you near us. That sort of thing. Jesus, however, taught that the kingdom was available to everyone. We just sang about it. I love that song. It just goes through everyone. The sinners, the thieves, and all of us. You know, Everyone, even those considered unclean, Jesus is saying, come to the table. My Father's prepared this for you. Okay, think about when you read through Scripture, Jesus had so many friendships with tax collectors and with sinners and with prostitutes and, and the woman at the well, and he went on and on. Um, and the Jewish leaders condemned him for those relationships. But what do those relationships actually teach us? Okay, when we see Jesus spending time with the least of these, with those that we might think unclean, I'm not going to hang around that person. Look at him. He makes me uncomfortable just to look at him. But Jesus is there spending time with him. Just that fact alone shows us God's grace, God's mercy, 
you guys love. The fact that the master in the parable sends the servant far away, go everywhere, alleys, back roads, go out to the country lanes, go to every corner of the earth and persuade everyone to come. That indicates that the offer of salvation would be extended to everyone and that the Gentiles would be invited as well. Acts 1.8, you can read about how um, this offer goes to people to the ends of the earth, Scripture says. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. So note that the master is not just satisfied with a partially full banquet hall. Okay? The master doesn't want just a few people in these seats. He wants to fill hearts. We say that all the time. We're not here to fill seats. We're here to fill hearts. The master was not happy with, not, he wasn't, uh, he wasn't settled with having just part of the banquet hall full. He wants everyone. Why? Why does he want the banquet hall to be full? Because God so loved the world. He wants everyone to know about him. He doesn't want anyone to be left out. Fact is, not everyone will come in. Sadly, most will not. But that's why I'm here to hand out invitations to come to the banquet. And I know that's why a lot of you are here to help hand out invitations to come to the banquet. Come and meet Jesus. Come to the table. Come enjoy all the Lord has for you. Come enjoy it when you walk in the Spirit. Come enjoy those fruits of the Spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, forbearance, kindness, goodness, self control. That's why we do the music fest to invite people to the table. To invite people to Jesus. Jesus said in this parable, go and compel people to come. Music is one way to compel someone to come. Food is one way to compel someone to come. Okay, whatever bait we have to do, we use it. We catch them, we clean them. That's what we're supposed to do. Compel people to come in. Enjoy what the Lord has for us. Sadly, we get a lot of excuses. It's okay, God did too. God gives excuses every day. John MacArthur, theologian, pastor, he said this, God is more willing to save sinners than sinners are willing to be saved. Some people will not accept the invitation. Some people will make up excuses not to come. There's a lot of people who just don't know. How will they know if we don't tell them? Those who ignored the invitation to the banquet, they chose their own punishment. Those that choose not to accept Jesus Christ, they choose their own punishment. They miss out. In the parable, the master respects that choice. In the parable, the master, res he respects that excuse. You gave me an excuse? All right. That's your choice. In fact, the master made it permanent. You will not taste my banquet. And so it'll be with God's judgment on those who choose to reject Jesus. I'm not going to show you, code. It's what the Bible says. They will re we will have our choice confirmed. Accept Jesus or don't have a taste of the banquet. It's sad but true. And again, that's why I'm here. I think that's why a lot of you are here to point people to Christ. Because the dying world outside these walls there's a million problems in the world. I believe every one of them could be fixed with Jesus or prevented with Jesus, helped with Jesus. And I found it really interesting in this parable that the master, he did not instruct his servant to go back and ask those invited again. They were already invited twice. Okay, when the, when the servant came back and said, I went out and asked them and nobody came, he didn't say, oh, I know he just bought that piece of land. He wants to go walk it. Tell him, like, walk it quickly and then and then come. Or tell him to come and then I'll, I'll go walk him. I'll walk the property later with him. Like, he didn't go say, ask them again. He moved on to the people who hadn't heard. They had the invitation. They already knew about the banquet, but they chose not to partake. Instead of asking again, the master moves on. So step back, a couple questions, and then we're done. 
I like to do this a lot, especially with parables, because parables always have these different groups of people. So the question is, who are you in this story? Who do you relate to the most in the story? Quick recap, the king prepared this amazing banquet. He wanted all the people to come and eat and be filled. Jesus is speaking about being filled with him, with truth. Come to this great feast. Come experience Jesus. Jesus is saying, come experience me more fully, completely, deeply, eternally. And maybe you see yourself as one of the townspeople. Who are you in the story? Maybe you see yourself as one of these townspeople. And honestly, you did spend most of your life doing what you wanted to do. Living for yourself, or living for the day, or just, you didn't know maybe. Or maybe you made excuses for him. But then Christ came. And you got it. And it turned your life around. You got the invitation, you accepted the invitation, you went to the banquet. Or maybe you see yourself as one of those who are even a little bit further out. You're out by the country lanes, okay? Maybe you were the one that used to be in the, the pig pen, another parable, doing things that you have no right doing, making some really unwise and unhealthy choices, but you didn't care, it was fun. Or maybe you're just way out in the country roads and you just never knew. You just never heard the truth. How, how do you know if it's wrong if you've never been told? Maybe you were just so distant from the king that you didn't ever hear, or maybe you felt so distant you didn't really care. But then Christ came, and he asked you to come to the table, and you came. And maybe if you're honest, you're one of those who considers yourself really close to the king, like one of those sitting at the actual meal with Jesus. Maybe you think you're one of those guys. I'm already in. I know this stuff. I got it. I have a seat at the table. In fact, I can come to the table and I can go to the table when I want. When I want. Look, here's my invitation. But then we don't show up. I'm good, but we don't show up. I love the Lord, but I don't show up. With my lips, I say, I love you, Lord. But with my actions, I don't. We might be thinking, here's this in personal invitation that I have from the king. We all have it. But maybe you're thinking, I'm kind of taking it for granted. Yeah, thanks, God, for this invitation. I thank you that you love me enough that you sent your son to die in my place. And I know what you have for me. I gotta go do this instead. I know you prepared this amazing feast for me. You got something special for me. All these fruits of the Spirit. You got a plan and a purpose for my life, but I'm, I'm good. I got other things I need to do. Remember this person that I just described, that person sitting next to Jesus, re represents that religious person who thought that he didn't need Jesus. He thought he was okay without him. He knew all about Jesus, but he didn't believe in Jesus. He didn't have that relationship. He believed that religion was enough to get him to the table. He thought he was all set because of his works and the laws and the words that he spoke. But there was no relationship with the king. Is that you? The Bible says, one day you will say, Lord, Lord, and the Lord may say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. You ignored the invitation. There's one more character in this story. You don't think much about this character in the story, the servant. The servant was Jesus in the story. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, when we become a Christian, a Christ follower, we become the servant. And that takes us back to the first parable. We want to be the servant because we love the Lord and we love other people. We don't just come to the banquet because there's good food. We come to the banquet because other people need to know about Jesus. A servant is one who is very close to the master. A servant is the one who prepares the meal, sets up the table, does all the groundwork. He's the hands and the feet of the master. 
he invites the guests to come in. And then he goes out and he invites more guests in. And then he goes out to every corner of the kingdom and invites more people in. So everyone will know about the banquet. Servants are here to serve. Servants work for the king. We're not just at the banquet to say we're at the banquet. Servants allow themselves to be used by the king in ways that might be uncomfortable to us at times. Servants are here to work for the king and do things that we never thought we could do. Do things that other people aren't doing. Do things that are hard. If it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Servants are here to be the hands and feet for the masters so that other people can come and be with the king as well. Experience what he has to offer. So again, it's interesting to note that the king never asked the servant to go and ask that original group of people again. He moved on to the next group. See, the point here is that the king extends the offer to everyone, but he will not force anyone to make that choice. Your choice. We have free will. We can choose or not. We must all choose this day who we will serve. Do we desire to serve the Lord and other people out of love? Or if we're honest with ourselves, do we desire to serve ourselves? And this came up in our daily Bible study reading us on Facebook every morning, Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a choice we need to make and live out. This Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we have been given this amazing blessing. We have this huge opportunity where people are going to be fed. Kind of like a banquet. People are going to be fed good news. People are going to be fed truth about Jesus through music and word and prayer, love and action. Lives are going to be changed. Pray about it. The dying world outside of these doors, they need to know about Jesus. I had a pastor friend that went out and did research. He asked 100 people on the street. 100 people on the street, he said, do you believe in heaven? 60 people said, yeah. 60 out of 100 said, yep, I believe in heaven. You think that's pretty encouraging. That's over half. At least 60 people believe in heaven. Four out of that 60, so that's four out of 104%, believe that Jesus is the way to get to heaven. Everybody else thought they could get to heaven some other way, even though Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's either the truth or he's a liar. We gotta get people to Jesus. We gotta get people to the banquet. We gotta compel them to come to the banquet. I've got one more song to play, um, and then we'll be done. I'm gonna go ahead and play that song and then I have some information, some details I want to share. Um, I have deeper and shallower details about the festival. Um, what I'll do is play this song. It's fitting for the, um, the message that we just talked about. So listen to this last song. You can just stay seated and listen to it. And then um, I'm going to, if you want to know more details about the festival, I'll share them with you. But real quick, I want us all to know we're all invited 7 o'clock Friday night down at the Farmer's Market Pavilion for a time of prayer and worship. Um, we don't know what will happen yet. We might have music, we might not. It might just be a time of prayer. We get right on the stage and we pray for the bands and other churches and the people who might come to this festival. We pray for the people who don't know about the festival. We, we just pray. 7 o'clock Friday night down at the um, Farmer's Market Pavilion. Next Saturday, gates open at 2 o'clock. Come at 2 o'clock, bring a chair, sit, relax, have a great time, enjoy the music, come and go as you um, one, two, the fireworks fest goes on across State Street behind Drex Subs. There'll be a, another band over there. Our bands run to the Farmer's Market Pavilion. Uh, bands start at 3 o'clock and they end at the fireworks. We have seven bands coming from Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Nashville, Tennessee, and all over New York State. They'll be there playing all day, completely free. Um, there'll be food there. We have a food booth set up. There'll be a couple food trucks in the area. We might still have bounce houses. There's going to be games for the children. 
um, games for tweens, games for adults even, yard game type thing. So there's going to be all that going on. Last thing, Sunday morning. Sunday morning, the sanctuary will be closed here. We're going to be worshiping right down in the Farmer's Market Pavilion. Uh, we have two other churches definitely going to be worshiping with us. I, I invited 100 and plus churches to come worship with us. Two new churches from Watertown are going to come as well with their worship teams. And they're going to play and sing with us. So it sounds like we're going to have at least five churches represented there for worship with us. So that'll be awesome. So Sunday morning, come at 10. So Friday at 7. Saturday at 3 if you want. That's when the music starts. Sunday, um, 10 o'clock, is a free breakfast. Completely free breakfast. Come at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, undefeated. If they're back from Pennsylvania, they'll be playing this weekend. Um, they will lead worship. Jay Trainer from Robert Wesleyan College will do the message. And then uh, we'll have a combination of worship music. So that's what's going to happen. If you want a little bit more details about some of this stuff, um, some of you know this stuff already. Some have questions. I have answers. But we'll play.